Um, so I am a, a research agronomist. I specialise in, in pastures really um, and I've spent a lot, a lot of the last 10 years uh, evaluating pasture species. I'm also the last speaker before lunch. Uh, again, is anyone here at the sheep field day? Well you've heard this, uh, you're going to be really bored so I'm sorry about that. Could everyone just stand up? Because I am the last speaker before lunch. So just, you know, wake up a little bit. The people who have heard this already, you can sneak out now, no one will even notice. Um, what I wanted to do, I just wanted to get a bit of a feel for what the audience is. So if, if, you, if you are a, a farmer or you work on a farm or your family's still got a farm, stay standing. Everyone else sit down. Okay. If on that farm you run cattle, um, stay standing. Everyone else sit down. Got another one. You came to the wrong field day. <laughs> um, if on that farm you run, in, in, in addition to the, the cattle that you run, you grow crops, um, stay standing. Everyone else, anyone that doesn't grow crops, sit down. Good, good. People that are still standing, if the cropping component of your business is 50% is or more of your business, stay standing. Okay, all right, thank you. That gives me a bit of an idea. All right, so, so what I'm, I'm here really representing uh, um, the Evercrop project. Uh, I've got my name and Jeff Casburn's name down the bottom, so this is sort of our presentation. What, what this is is going to be a, a sort of a 20 minute introduction to the work we're doing, uh, the, the project, the work we're doing, and, and a bit of a, a, a leg into, well, cover cropping, why. Really it's about pasture establishment, getting, getting your pastures established. If you're going to put the investment in, uh, what's the importance of, of getting uh, you know, best bang for your buck? After lunch, there's going to be a workshop session, which Jeff's going to um, lead, uh, and that's going to sort of work through some of the examples. And I was interested to hear about the, you know, the valuing the, the pasture, valuing the feed base, because that's very relevant here. Uh, but in a, in a mixed farming zone, it's even more complicated than, than what John was describing in his talk. But anyway, we'll get to that. All right, so in terms of Evercrop, Evercrop's a, a, a project that's uh, funded by the Future Farm Industry, CRC, and its purpose was to evalu evaluate and develop the role for perennials in crop livestock systems. So perennials, you know, plants that you grow, that, that you sow one year and they survive. The individual plant survives multiple years. Um, and, and putting them into a cropping context, bearing in mind that a lot of people in the cropping zone uh, ha have, a f have more of a focus on their crop than they do on their, their pasture. So trying to, to find the fit for the, for the perennials in this sort of mixed farming system. In terms of the project, there's three major nodes of, of activity, three locations. Um, we've got southern New South Wales, which is the bit that I lead. The, the South Australian and Victorian Mallee, so they're, they're actually more interested in shrubs in the, in the, in the Mallee. There's not many perennials there in, in their cropping soils, so, so looking at the role of shrub belts. And then in the northern WA wheat belt, where they're looking at uh, pasture cropping with tropical grasses. So, so, and of course we're not really interested in shrubs and we're not all that interested in tropical grasses either, if we're going to be honest with each other, here in New South Wales. But, but we're interested in, in you know, the things that you guys grow, temperate grasses, um, particularly loosen as well. And of course it's a fairly long run program, project, so uh, it's, it's, it, it'll finish in, in 2016 hopefully, uh, which gives us a good, good run of data, um, which enables us to, to tackle things that are a bit more complicated than an average three year project could. Okay, so in the other nodes in, in, in the Mallee and in, in WA where they don't have um, any perennials, a lot of the work, a lot of the focus of this project is on increasing perennials in the landscape. You know, how can we get more perennials into the landscape? But if you look at, at New South Wales, southwest New South Wales, the, the case for, for increased perennials is, is probably not a strong case in, in, in broad terms, in net terms. Um, Lucerne's been grown here since the 1800s. Uh, a, According to some of the surveys that our project ran uh, a couple of years ago, uh, approximately 50% of the land is under pasture and 30% of that is under perennial pasture. So, so we've got a, a good standard perennial pasture already. And if you believe any of the modelling that, that we've done, the economic modelling, um, you know, that's about where we need to be in terms of you know, where, where, what our optimal adoption rates are. Um, and, and of course in our zone 72% of farmers use lucerne, so lucerne's 
Lucerne really is a, a, a key species, particularly as you move further west. You know, it's quite difficult if, if you're in the lower rainfall area, you don't actually have many options other than Lucerne. Um, so now that's not to say that individual farmers couldn't increase, you know, their adoption of, of perennials, but on a broad scale, we're sort of saying, well, you know, we don't have the strong case that the guys in the Mallee and the guys in, in WA have for increasing perennials. In terms of the pasture performance in our, in our zone, uh, <clears throat> a second survey that we ran showed that 69% of growers ranked poor establishment as one of the top three reasons for, for ending the pasture phase. So, so poor establishment is really on the radar in, in terms of what's holding them back in, in their pastures. 75% of growers ranked poor persistence as one of the top three reasons for ending the pasture phase. So, so firstly big problems getting it going and then the second big problems getting it to, to, to last as long as we want it to last. So, so that brought, brought, it, brought us to a situation where we were defining the knowledge gap. So we, had, we knew we had 80 years of trials, you know, research agronomists, pasture agronomists such as myself, um, suggesting pastures shouldn't be uh, established under a cover crop. Yet our surveys were showing us that 80% of farmers in southern New South Wales were using cover crops to establish their pastures. And you think, well, you know, why is this, this mismatch here? Um, so it gave us a very... Uh, a very clear idea of what we should be doing. We, we, know, we know establishment is a big issue, we know persistence is a big issue, we know from the agronomy trials that people probably shouldn't be establishing pastures under a cover crop you know, from, a, from a pasture perspective, yet most people are. You know, why is that? So that, that's essentially the background as to why we're focusing on this bit of work. Just a definition, a cover crop, I use the term cover crop and undersowing interchangeably, uh, and you probably all know this, but just so we're all on the same page. Uh, it's the simultaneous, simultaneous establishment of a crop and pasture in the same paddock. So uh, you sow the, the pasture and the crop seed in, in autumn or early winter. Um, you grow that paddock and, and don't graze it. You take the crop off uh, at the end of the year and then after the pasture is recovered, it becomes your pasture paddock and, and off we shoot. And, and you keep it for as long as you, know, you keep it in your system. Okay, <clears throat> just to reflect upon the importance of, of establishment, successful est uh, pasture establishment. We know when we establish a pasture that it's not, it's not like establishing a crop. You, you sow a crop, you have a failure, you write your losses off, you go again next year. You sow a pasture, you have a failure, you've got this enduring effect. You know, you've got it for three to five to 20 years, however long you keep a pasture. So there's a fair bit riding on it. If, 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 uh, I, I guess another way of looking at it is if, if there's a, a cost of poor establishment, you multiply that, that cost you know, for every year you hold that pasture. So that's, that's important. And, and in terms of persistence, for perennials we're talking about perennial plant longevity, so how long that, that, that individual can survive. For annuals, it's the ability to, to remain in the sward year after year, so that, that involves having to set seed and then come back from seed in, in future years. And of course the sequence of years is important as well. Uh, if you get a, you know, an average year followed by a good year, you, you, you get a, a different effect to if you have an average year followed by a really bad year. So, and, and of course we've got no control over s the sequence of years and we don't know what that sequence will be until after the event. So that's a reality of, of managing pastures. We know that you know, if, if you're going to invest the, the money on, on pasture establishment, if you can Im improve the, the productivity, you'll probably improve your, your return on the investment. So everyone, you know, if they go to the trouble of establishing, they want the, the best result they can get. Uh, and we know that it has other benefits as well, such as, you know, reduced weed incursion. So that, that can be a livestock benefit because of, you know, improved quality of feed or it could be a, a cropping benefit because you don't have those weeds to deal with in your cropping phase. And of course then you've got the, the benefit of the, the nitrogen fixation from the legume. So if you, if you sow a legume and you don't get that, that legume to grow or you get weeds instead, well you're not getting the, you might get the biomass but you're not getting the, the nitrogen fixation. So that's also a, a benefit that, that is expressed both in the livestock and in the, the cropping enterprise. Uh, and of course there's other benefits as well, increased ground cover, improved animal health, aesthetics, some people just like green grass, um, so a whole range of factors there. So, so when, we're, when we're coming to the decision of, well, okay, we're going to sow a paddock, how are we going to sow that paddock, there's a decision process about, well, we've got to, we've got to balance the agronomy with the, the farm finances as well. So there's all sorts of factors to consider. 
um, you know, and, and I think John actually touched on them a little bit, but, but if you add the cropping component, then, it's, then it sort of complicates the issues further. You, you know, you've got the, the grain price. What, what's the value of that crop that you sowed on top of your pasture? What's the, the grain yield? You know, the competition of the pasture on the crop plus the, the, the reduced sowing rate that you've got to put in. Uh, you know, the livestock price, that changes, that, so that, and that essentially drives the value of the pasture, which, which John talked about really well, I thought. Um, things like pasture yield, length of pasture phase, pasture value, seasonal conditions. So there's a whole range of factors that somehow you've got to marry up in your own mind and then make a decision to, as to, well, how, how are you going to actually sow this pasture next year? It's quite complicated. In terms of our project, we've, we've embarked on, upon a number of activities. <laughs> In terms of the, the small plot research that we've done, we, we've undertaken some, some cover cropping small plot trials uh, to add to the 80 years of data that has come before us. Um, and we've looked at things like spring versus autumn sowing, um, Lucen, Chicory uh, mentioned it earlier, uh, Phalaris, Cox, but we actually don't have that many perennial pasture options, so, so it's actually easy to include most of the treatments uh, in these sorts of trials. So, so we've done small plot research to try and quantify that, but of course it's seasonally dependent and so it depends on what years you do these trials as to what, what results you get and that's, that's the nature of the game as well. We've done some farmer participatory research where we've, we've got uh, farmers to sow these trials with their own gear. So this is a kilometre long strip where the, the, the farmers just turn the, the crop off his air seeder for the, for the strip and, and sown away. And we've just helped him, we've set up a trial so that we could collect meaningful data off it, uh, but, but let him do it. You know, how, how would you have done it? Do it with your machinery, do it with your you know, varieties and your sowing rates, and let's measure what the effect is. So we've done a bit of that, and that's provided us some meaningful data as well. The, just in terms of our activity, there we go. Each of these stars represents a, essentially a field site, so we've got a, a good spread. I think we've got about 20 you know, trial sites. Um, some newer sites up here, we've sort of moved our emphasis from around, around the Wagga region. We've sort of got some of our newer trials up here. There's quite a lot of activity and, and you know, it's all about getting exposure to different environments and different seasons. It's about um, getting in exposure to different people as well, so to, you know, because there's a lot about learning, co-development, um, taking this, this message out to farmers and, and really letting, letting them make the decision because they're the ones that know their business. So the project's been quite uh, active. One of the important things we've done, and this probably is what sets us apart from the, the 80 years of cover cropping research that's gone before us, is that we've decided, well, um, it's not enough just to do a trial in a particular year and, and use that result. Uh, we need to, to have some mechanism by which we can yeah, make, we can balance this, this agronomy versus the, the farm finance thing and, 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 and try, and, try and trade off, I guess, um, the various components of this, this decision. So what we've done, what we've done, I haven't done it, Jeff McCormick actually built this, is, is just a little prototype decision support tool which allows us to put you know, half a dozen fairly simple inputs in uh, that, that farmers, most of those farmers would know off the top of their head uh, and then you know, decide, well, at what point, you know, the red line in this case is the straight sown pasture, the blue line is the cover cropped pasture, at what point, you know, does it become more, more economic, more profitable perhaps, um, to, to leave the cover crop off. Um, so this is, this is actually what we're going to go through in the, um, in the workshop later on, uh, but I just put it up there just to flag, that's, that's where our research is sort of heading. And I'd also emphasise that's a prototype, so we've still got some work to do on it. Just probably the final thing that I wanted to talk about was, you know, just this concept of, of successful establishment and, and it goes back to John's talk as to how, how do you value this, you know, your grass, essentially. Um, can we define success in pasture establishment? And I'd argue probably not really. Um, there, there isn't a standard value which you can use to say, you know, a, a tonne of grass is worth so many cents or so many dollars per, per, per tonne. Um, there aren't many established ben benchmarks as there is in the cropping industry, you know, they've got good benchmarks for water use efficiency and that sort of thing. Pastures don't have that. Um, it's complicated by the, the, the livestock cropping matrix on the farm, and so there's a lot of interactions there that are, that are difficult to account for. Uh, it is likely to differ between farms, between paddocks within a farm, between years within a paddock. You know, you, you, you do the same thing uh, in the same paddock in two different years and you'll get a different result and that complicates things. 
Um, success and establishment, is that a, an agronomic term, you know, plant density or herbage mass? Um, or is, it, or is it an economic term, um, you know, dollars per, per hectare? Or, or in fact, is it both? Um, so all of those sorts of things uh, sort of complicate the issue and, and cloud the issue. And, and as a result, you know, we, we don't really have a good understanding, as John was saying, we don't have a good, good grasp of, of what our pasture is worth and, and, no worries, and what, uh, what steps we need to take to make it, you know, worth more for us, for our business. Okay, uh, so... Therefore, if it's difficult to uh, determine whether, whether uh, establishment is successful, how do we determine that the, whether the method of establishment is successful or not? And, and so that's, that's really the crux of, of the workshop later on. But just to give you an idea, you know, the farmer walks into his paddock, that's his paddock. This is actually a paddock, a trial paddock we had at Area Park. Um, this is, you know, sowed this pasture last year under a cover crop. Is that success? Is that what you'd call success? Hard to say, I wouldn't like to judge. A lot of that's flea bone. In fact, 60% of that is flea bone. But still, does that achieve your, your goals as a farmer? Um, I'm sure you'd all agree that you'd probably like that pasture a lot better. That, that actually has 30% flea bone. Um, but for a farmer, that decision is much harder to make because he doesn't have the side-by-side -side comparison. He sows a paddock, and that's his paddock. And that's, and that's all he's got to look at to, to make that decision as to whether that was successful or not. Um, then again, you could say, well, well, perhaps I'd like that one instead. And of course, that one is a much better pasture, there's no doubt about it, but, but that one didn't give, give you any grain yield either in the establishment year. So, you know, would you be happy to just go with that one, where you got a little bit of grain yield and, and, and a reasonable pasture, uh, or, or the other? And, and how do you make that decision? That's the point. Okay, so that's, that's what we'll go over in the workshop session, discuss success in, in farmer terms. We'll use case studies from our, our trial work uh, just to help aid, aid that. So we've, we've actually generated some numbers on you know, what grain yields were and what, what pasture biomass is and that. So, so that'll just help you know, provide a case study that we can work through. And then we'll use the decision support tool just to, just to I, it, it's more, it's not about giving you an answer whether you know, cover cropping is right or wrong, it's about going through the process of making that decision and, and what factors should you take into account. And it's probably about you telling us what we've missed as well, what other factors you know, we need to, to be considering in this context. The last slide, it's just worth um, mentioning that the, the, the project's ongoing, as I said it goes to 2016, so there, there is stuff that's, that's ongoing. Uh, one of the things that we're doing um, Tom Nordlum and Tim Hutchings are undertaking a, a financial risk analysis of, of cover cropping. So they're, they're actually doing an in-depth economic analysis of it. Um, not just whether it's you know, uh, profitable or not, but taking into account the, the risk profiles. It's, it's obviously highly seasonal depend, seasonally dependent. Um, so they're trying to, to, to get a sensitivity on risk factors. You know, 10%, 20% of years, uh, it, it, does it work or does it not? Or, or trying to define some benchmarks, you know, for example, completely hypothetically, you, you need to get two tonnes of grain yield before it's worth your while, stuff like that. Um, so that's, that's underway and I think that'll be quite valuable. We've got some agronomy trials up at, around Cowra and Condoblin, uh, refining techniques of cover cropping. So there we're looking at different crops, putting, you know, not only wheat and barley, but also canola, one trial's got lupins as a, as a cover crop and seeing what effect that has. Um, and also using, you know, skip row technology where we only put the seed down half the row, the, the crop seed down half the row, those sorts of things, just try and reduce the competition. And of course, this, is, this photo here is a photo of an agronomy trial that we've got, <coughs> which is there to enhance establishment of pasture mixtures. We've heard a little bit today about, you know, the importance of balancing diets, uh, the importance of, uh, of mixed swords. Uh, one of the problems we have particularly in the cropping zone is our grasses. This is Phalaris here. Um, so here, this, this is a photograph of a trial where we've got Lucent sown in one row and Phalaris sown in the other as a way of, uh, that's one of a number of combinations that we've got. Um, methods of, of trying to get multiple species established but to persist better, in, particularly in our drier environments. And if you want to know more about that, uh, We've got one of those uh, field trials at the Graham Centre field site, which, which I think there's a field day next month, um, so, so that we're going to go over that in detail there. Um, but for now, I think we'll leave it there. 
and I'm happy to take questions, but the workshop session after lunch will go through some of our stuff in more detail. Right, if you'd all like to thank you for oh, helping Richard. Um, <coughs>